Amen. On the count of three, I want you to uh, say with me with full confidence, the battle belongs to the Lord, all right? One, two, three. The battle belongs to the Lord. Okay, find Daniel chapter 6 in your Bible or on your device. Uh, We are uh, concluding the biographical section of the book of Daniel uh, today, looking at the last story of his life. So while you're looking that up, I want to remind you, two weeks from today, uh, we are uh, calling the the entire Grace uh, Fellowship family into 21 days of prayer and fasting. You have a commitment card uh, to let us know that you want to join that journey. We want to join that journey uh, with you, so put that in the offering receptacle at the end, uh, or put it at uh, leave it at connection point. Uh, we want to know that uh, we are doing this together. Twenty one days of prayer and fasting. Okay, so we have come to the probably the most famous story. In the book of Daniel, historical context, Daniel uh, has been in exile in Babylon for about uh, 60 plus years. He was a part of that Jewish minority that was carried off from Jerusalem uh, into this pagan culture, called by God through the prophet Jeremiah to serve the king and to work for the peace and prosperity of the city, even though they do not acknowledge the one true God. At the end of chapter 5 last week, we saw the Babylonian Empire give way to the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, Belshazzar gives way to Darius or Cyrus. Uh, Many believe that he's the same person. Uh, So we have a new kingdom. uh, We have a new king. uh, But we have the same Daniel. Okay, so let's get into this story. Verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one. To whom these satraps would give Account so that the king might suffer no loss. So Daniel is in his late 70s or early 80s at this point. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar noticed a, a particular spirit in, in Daniel and elevated him in high position of his kingdom. Uh, so now uh, Darius has noticed the same excellent qualities in Daniel. Verse 3, Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned He planned to set him over the entire kingdom. So out of these three, Daniel is going to be promoted once again, this time to the second highest position, only under Darius himself by virtue of his character and competence. Character and competence. Say that with me. Character and competence. Say it one more time. Character and competence. Friends, this is so important. He's been faithful to his God by serving the king with character and competence. Okay, this has been his calling decades ago. Uh, through the prophet Jeremiah, called Daniel uh, to seek the peace and prosperity of this pagan culture. Even though Babylon is now being ruled by a different empire, this calling has not changed because God's plan is not done. And so Daniel is at the height of his career. He has been elevated to the second position in the kingdom. Why? Some people, and you know them, some people have risen through the ranks because of who they know. You know, it's, you got to know somebody. It's, it's, in, uh, it's all in who you know, right? Some people are like that. Daniel rose in the ranks, not because of who he knew, but because of who he was. He was a person of character and competence. Cal Newport wrote a book a couple of years ago entitled, So Good They Can't Ignore You. <laughs> so Good They Can't Ignore You, talking about excellence in the workplace. This was Daniel. He had character. He had competence. Friend, in this world where everything is political, the workplace is political, the marketplace is political, the political place is political, where one hand washes the other, dr- uh, bribes and kickbacks are the norm. Everyone's you know, networking to their own advantage. Everyone's working an angle, and everybody has a price. And Daniel, uh, Daniel is found to have character and competence. Darius recognizes in him a man that has no such personal agenda. Here's a man that every day goes to work and his, his sole purpose is to serve the king and to promote, uh, to seek the peace and the prosperity of the kingdom. And so thus in Daniel, Darius finds a man he can truly trust. He doesn't have an angle. He doesn't have an agenda except to serve the king. So as often happens, when you have that kind of uh, character and competence, it doesn't sit well with your competition. In verse four, it says, then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. 
and no error or fault was found in him. This is really amazing. Daniel has been in the system for decades. He has existed so long in this political world, and yet his enemies cannot find fault with him. I mean, that's what you do in the political system, right? You dig up dirt and you sling mud. And so they cannot find dirt. They cannot mix the mud. These guys are coming up empty. And so verse five, they go back to the original playbook. What's the playbook? Chapter three, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They use his faith against him. Verse five says, these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. There's got to be something about his religion that we can use against him. Verse 7, here's the the plan. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed. Now, this is the first lie they tell to Darius. Because Daniel, what is he? He's one of these counselors. He's one of these governors. He didn't agree to this. He wasn't even a part of this. But they're telling Darius that everyone has agreed to this idea that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except you, O King Darius, let's throw him in the den of lions. Okay, so they lie to Darius about Daniel being in agreement with this. And of course, what emperor who's going to refuse personal praise? In ancient culture, uh, emperors were considered to be gods in their, in their empire, in their kingdom. And so this was not an unusual idea. And so Darius thinks about it and says, okay, let, uh, sounds, sounds good. Let's go for it. And so they say to him, verse 8, now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed. Cannot be changed according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. It cannot be taken back. It cannot be changed. Verse 9, King Darius signs the document. Verse 10, when Daniel heard that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave, gave thanks before his God. Notice the end of that, what? As he had done previously, as he had done previously in the face of certain punishment, If he doesn't comply with this injunction, what does Daniel do? He does what he had done previously. He does what he has always done. What did he always do? He always goes home. He always opens the windows. He always faces Jerusalem. He always gets on his knees and he always prays. Note this, he always prays with thanksgiving. I'll get to that in a second. But I'm going to ask a question. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but surely I'm not the only one in the room that's guilty of this. I don't know how you pray at home. Uh, for us, uh, when we're around the table together, uh, we, we hold hands, we pray out loud, we all bow our heads, we all join in the prayer. But have you ever been outside? Have you ever been out in public? Have you ever been in a place, maybe a restaurant, um, where you, you, know, you don't want to draw attention to yourself? Is that just me? Any, any guilty parties here? And so maybe you don't hold hands, maybe you don't pray out loud. I mean, you can pray in your mind, you can pray in your heart, right? I mean, we can do that, right? Uh, Daniel, Daniel, could he have compromised his procedure? Um, I'll, just leave the, I'll just leave the windows closed. It's just 30 days, right? Um, I don't need to face Jerusalem. I can, I can pray to God wherever, you know, I'm faced. It, it, you know, I, I, I don't have to pray out loud. I don't have to close my, uh, have you ever prayed in the car? Open eyes are preferable, okay? So Daniel, you can do this. You can do this. What's the, what's the big deal about your procedure? And yet the procedure was the big deal to Daniel. This was who he was. This was his identity. This is what he did. This is what he always done. He has always done this. Previously he had did, done this. And so in his mind, in his heart, if I compromise this, what else am I going to give in to? You see his point? If I bow to this kind of pressure, what else am I going to bow to? If I don't bow to God, I'm bowing to them. What is, what is my faith worth? If I compromise this, do I trust God or not? And so he did what he always did. He didn't surrender to, to, to the earthly pressure. He didn't rely on the favor of a king. He, he isn't worried about the circumstance or the outcome, the repercussion. That's for God to handle. He's just going to do what he has always done. He's going to do today what he did the day before and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. Go back 60 years. He has been doing this every day. And he does it with thanksgiving. He's, he's giving thanks for this. I mean, for another battle, for another opportunity of ridicule and abuse, for another potential death warrant, he's, he's giving thanks for this. Friends, he's, he's known that he's been here before. He knows what he's up against. And so he thanks the God of Israel. What does he thank him for? 
Well, I think he's thanking him for directing the affairs of men. I think he's thanking the God of Israel for being on his side. For, because if God is on his side, who can be against him, right? If he's thanking the God, for, the God of Israel for whatever he's going to do because he knows that God is going to reveal his glory in this situation. He knows God is going to work all things together for his good in this situation. And so he, he just prays like he has always prayed. He prays with thanksgiving. And while he prays, verse 11, these men come by agreement. They all got together and said, hey, let's do this. And found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Now, here's the thing. You follow God no matter what. You serve the people with excellence and faithfulness. You live a life of character and competence. You love the community at the cost of yourself. You're going to get noticed. Sometimes you're going to get noticed for good. Sometimes you're not going to get noticed for good. Now, you think about this and Daniel's commitment. Had Daniel been a lukewarm God follower, had he been a spasmodic God follower? Had he from one day or the next kind of compromised in his following? This scheme would not have worked, okay? The reason why these men went to his house to catch him praying is because they knew if they went to his house, they would catch him praying. So guess what? They went to his house and what did they find? They found him praying because they knew this about him. So verse 13, they, they find him praying and then they go, tattle on the, uh, they go tattle on Daniel to the king. And they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles in Judah, uh, Darius knew this, pays no attention to you. Now this is the second deception. Okay, he pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you have signed, but makes a petition three times a day. They had what they needed to trap Daniel. But get this, friends, they had what they needed to trap Darius. They needed to trap Darius in order to trap Daniel, And so they presented this law, this appeal to his pride. They lied to him about Daniel being in agreement. Daniel was not in agreement. And they also lied to him about pay, Daniel paying no attention. If there's anybody in the kingdom that was looking out for the king, it was Daniel. And Darius knew this. This was not about loyalty to the, to the king. This was about a law that was unjust. It was ill-conceived. And it was just something that Daniel could not surrender to. So verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind, he purposed in his heart to deliver Daniel. There's got to be some way to exempt Daniel from this. He labored till the sun went down to rescue Daniel. There's so much in this verse. Friends, the king was distressed. Some translations use the phrase, he was displeased with himself. Displeased. Have you ever been displeased with yourself? Yeah, I am, sometimes I'm displeased with how little I'm displeased with myself. You know, but, uh, D- Darius was not displeased with Daniel refusing not to be trapped. He was not even displeased that the governors had trapped him. Darius was disappointed in himself for having been trapped. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done something, said something, made a decision that came back to bite you? And now you're trapped. Now you're in a situation of your own making. Daniel was a victim of his own pride. His inability to see through the deception, his failure to think this through and the implications of the decision and the subsequent jeopardy that he created for his friend Daniel. They are now both trapped. This indicates the, king, the, the king's heart. I mean, by the way, just for extra credit, this is the king that s- starts sending the, the, the Israelites back to, to Judah. This is the king that allows the exiles to return to Jerusalem. This is the king that sent Nehemiah back uh, to rebuild the walls. Darius had a sensitivity to the people of God, no doubt influenced by Daniel. You can see this in the way that he uh, talks to Daniel. Verse 16, the the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions because this injunction cannot be revoked. So the, the king declares to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. It is my prayer, Daniel, that you will be saved. Verse 17, and a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Verse 18, then the king went to his palace and he couldn't sleep and he couldn't eat and nothing could please him. Nothing could comfort him. Nothing could 
soothe his distress or his displeasure with himself. He was distraught through the entire night. Verse 19, then at break of day, the king rose and went in haste to the den of lions. He came near to the den where Daniel was. He cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said, I'm still here. Still here. Verse 21, Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, Darius, you need to know, O king, I have not done you harm. I have done you no harm. I have been faithful to you. I have been loyal to you. Verse 23, then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, verse 24, and, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and by the way, trapped him, were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, friends, this is not because the lions weren't hungry. The lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Does it bother you that they threw in the family? <laughs> it was, <laughs> I'm not laughing at that. Uh, it's, it's, it's common practice, friends. In, in ancient culture, you will read this uh, in, in historical documents. You know, when, when, the, when the man is guilty, everyone goes down with the ship. This was common practice in pagan kingdoms. Uh, this, is, this part of the story usually doesn't make it into the Sunday school lesson. Because we don't want to traumatize the kids. Uh, but it, it might be a good reminder, girls to pick your man wisely because it will come back to bite you, okay? That's extra credit. So uh, verse 25, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples. Now he does exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did years ago. He wants the entire kingdom, he wants his entire empire to know of his experience, the one true living God. So he writes to his entire kingdom, peoples, nations, and languages as well in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you, I make a decree then all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus. They lived happily ever after, of course, until they didn't. So stay tuned to the story. This concludes the biographical portion of the book of Daniel. This is the life of Daniel, the story of Daniel. What do we learn from this incredible life culminating in one of the most famous stories in the Bible? What does Daniel in first century BC have to say to followers of Jesus in 21st century AD? We've seen this before, but let me give you these three characters. Number one, exercise character. Exercise character. If Daniel is saying anything to us, it is to, ex we, we've talked about character through this entire series. Daniel is the epitome of godly character, competence and character. And people loved him for it and people hated him for it. But the response of others, what other, other people thought about this or thought about him wasn't the motivation in Daniel's heart. Daniel was godly because he was godly. Daniel was godly because he lived for God and God alone. Daniel distinguished himself because he wasn't rising. He wasn't pushing himself. He wasn't promoting himself up the ranks. He was just simply serving uh, the king by honoring God. He was honoring God by serving the king. He was working for the peace and the prosperity of the kingdom because this is what God called him to do. And he just kept doing it day after day after day. He lived first First and foremost, for the glory of God and let the chips fall where they may. This, is what's, this was who he was. How did he get to be this kind of person? Well, friends, we have to back up to chapter one because in chapter one, we see Daniel making resolutions. This 16, 17-year-old kid ripped from his home, separated from his family, thrown into this pagan culture, this abusive culture with all the temptation and the pressure to conform. And yet he resolved in his heart as a teenager. And then for every day for the next 60 plus years, he's making this, this resolution, this commitment to honor his God, regardless of consequence or outcome. 
And because of that, he becomes a man of integrity in a hostile workplace. He becomes a man of morality in a decadent culture. He becomes a man of stability in a chaotic world. He just keeps doing what he has always been doing. Everyday decisions that lead to an indomitable life. The story of Daniel is about the indispensability of trustworthy character, an identity grounded in the holiness of God, in faithfulness to God. Friends, you know, you know how easy it is to give in. You know how easy it is to go along, to get along. You know how easy it is to just simply compromise just a little bit to save your neck. And you can do that for a while and not create too many waves. But what happens when the going gets tough? What happens when your character is on the line? What happens when your life and your future is at stake? There's a Greek poet by the name of Archilochus. I think, I I don't know how to pronounce that. But anyway, he lived about 100 years before Daniel and he wrote this in one of his writings. We don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. Friends, when things get tough, that's not scripture, but it aligns with the truth of God. uh, Crisis first reveals character before it develops character. And if you don't have the character to respond, you will fall to the character that you have. You cannot exercise strength that has not yet been built. You only know the strength that you have by it being tested. Sometimes, you know, in, in, our, in our pride, we sometimes have this lofty view of ourselves, assuming that when the real test comes, you know, we're, we're, I'll just rise above the occasion with resources that I've not yet developed. How does that, that can't happen. Daniel didn't have a sudden spurt of courage to face a possibility of death. Daniel was able to deal with the den because he did what he had always done for decades. In chapter one, it was a diet. What's the big deal about food? Daniel, just eat the food. Don't don't make waves. But in chapter six, it's a den of lions. And here's the point that you cannot miss. Daniel was able to deal with the den because he dealt with the diet. He had had made made a resolution about the diet which gave him the courage. Friends, today's courage is built on yesterday's resolve. In those small moments, in those private moments, moments that people don't see, in the present moments that don't seem to matter all that much in the long run, Daniel knew that every decision matters in the long run because short-term decisions develop long-term character. And character, Daniel found that character is its own reward. You have to realize this. Daniel's character was about the God of Israel For no one else and for nothing else, regardless of consequence and outcome, character is its own reward. Exercise character. Here's the second thing. Embrace opposition. Embrace opposition. Daniel was framed. There's no way to get around that. His peers conspired against him. They they worked to trap him. And again, had Daniel not been a man of character, he would have been a man of compromise. Therefore, he would never have been trapped. He would have been saved from this, but he had character. Now, let's, let's be honest about here. Here's the thing. Following Jesus is not always a life of disrespect and, and mistreatment. You know, you, you don't wake up every day and somebody's out to get you. Sometimes your Christian character actually plays to your favor. I think for the most part, people in this world, regardless of what they think about your faith, actually prefer people who don't lie, cheat, and steal, right? You know, if you're hiring somebody and someone says that they're a Christian, you kind of assume that they have a character uh, that could be trustworthy. That's not always the way it works. But uh, we know that your faith sometimes benefits you. Sometimes uh, it's a detriment to you. Sometimes uh, it works to your favor. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you get promoted. Sometimes you get fired. But for Daniel, it didn't matter. The consequence of character was secondary to the character of his character. You'll remember in the Gospels where Jesus talks about light and how light exposes darkness. That's the character of light. It cannot help but expose darkness. Otherwise, it's not light. But the consequence of that exposure differs with the people who are exposed. Jesus said some people, you know, they are exposed by the light and they come into the light. It leads them out of their darkness. They are attracted to the light. But then there are some people who hate the light because they love their darkness. And the exposure to the light just entrenches them further into their darkness. Friends, that's what character does. It either inspires character in others or exposes the lack of character in others. Again, it doesn't matter. We have character for character's sake. 
Think about this. Is, is there anything more is irritating than a sibling who does everything right when you're the sibling that's always getting in trouble? Do you have, do you have a sibling like that? And it's especially worse when, when your mother says, why can't you be like your brother? <laughs> Parents, that never works. Don't use that. Because here's what happens. Why can't you be more like, that makes you want to be what? Less like your brother. Now, here's the deal, friends. Uh, if, if you're the good sibling, but you're only the good sibling to make your other sibling look bad, friends, that's not character, that's pride. That's a personal agenda, okay? Why do, why do people hate do-gooders? Usually because it exposes our lack of do-goodness, right? I mean, you, you understand this? Uh, Jesus said, you know, when you show your light, some people are going to be attracted to it. Some people are going to be real. But this is important for us to understand as Jesus followers. One of the more common accusations that the world uh, presents toward us is that Christians are do-gooders. You know, we have this do-gooderism around it. You think you're better than us. Have you ever heard that one? Well, friends, think about this. If you are a genuine light, you are going to expose darkness, which creates in many people, they have to assuage their guilt because of that. And so they falsely accuse you of do-gooderism. You can't get around that. You can't help that. You just have to let the chips fall where they may. But let's be honest. Sometimes we don't convey that message. Sometimes we hate the sinner. We hate the sin and the sinner. And we don't come across with grace and truth. Jesus said, if they hate you because of me, take it. The Apostle Paul called it the offense of the gospel. If you offend because of the gospel, take it. In fact, embrace it. Friends, this is the key. I, I'm, I, we're talking about our lives in the world, our lives with unbelievers. Uh, salt and light, grace and truth. Salt affects things. Light exposes things. Grace and truth inspi- incites a response. The offense of the gospel. Friends, if you're a genuine follower of Jesus and you never offend, you're probably doing something wrong. But if you're a follower of Jesus and you always offend, you're probably doing something wrong. (laughs) Daniel Daniel wasn't good to make other people look bad. Otherwise, think about this. He would have gone straight to Darius and exposed the deceit of his enemies. But Daniel didn't tattle on the people who tattled on him. He was good for goodness sake. He was good for the glory of God. He was good because he was good. And he trusted his goodness to the God who judges justly. He embraced opposition, which leads to the last. He expected deliverance. He expected deliverance. Once again, we have to remind our stories that the end of the story is not the point of the story. Okay? Uh, This is usually the moral that comes out of the story. Serve God and nothing bad will happen to you. See Daniel? Daniel served God and the, the, and the lions did not devour him. Friends, that is, that, that is not the point of the story. God never promises you that. So I want to go back to the response that Darius had to Daniel. Uh, he says that, that very next morning, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the He didn't ask, Daniel, were you able to make it out alive? How were you able to handle all of those lions? He didn't ask that question. He wanted to know, was your God able to save? Daniel is not the hero of this story. God is. And the point of this story is that God is able, God is willing, and God will always, God will always save. Now, I thought about this uh, uh, this week. If God can shut the mouths of lions, why can't he shut the mouths of my enemies? <laughs> it would save us a whole lot of time and trouble, wouldn't it? Daniel was delivered from the lions. But we have to remind ourselves 2,000 years later, There are going to be believers in a Colosseum devoured by lions. Both were delivered. Both were saved. God always delivers. Sometimes he delivers from the lions. Sometimes he delivers through the lions. But God always delivers. So here's the thing, friends. You don't always know what God is going to do but you always know what God is going to do. He is always going to deliver and he's always going to show his glory and he's always going to work for your good. Larry Osborne in his book Thrive says, there will be times when following God's plan doesn't seem to be working. 
But those who have Daniel-like wisdom that begins with the fear of the Lord, that doesn't matter. Even when God's ways seem to lead nowhere, it is still the right path to take. He's always right, even when we think he's wrong. That's why we call him God. Friends, we see this in the cross, the ultimate bad producing the ultimate good. This is the story of Daniel. Daniel, in so many ways, is a precursor, is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Think about their stories. In both cases, the leaders of the day conspired against them. In both cases, the leaders of the day could, not, could find no fault in them. They were both convicted by false witnesses. And both of them trusted themselves to the God who judges justly. Darius tried to save Daniel. Pilate tried to save Jesus. But it would come at the expense of their own authority. So they chose not to do that. Daniel was thrown in a pit. Jesus was buried in a tomb. Both were sealed with a stone and both were found the next morning alive. All of these parallels with these, of course, distinctions. Daniel was righteous, but he wasn't blameless. Jesus is the only one who is perfect. And it tells us at the end of this chapter that Daniel lived on to prosper, but we know that he was to die later. But friends, Jesus lives forever and bears the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Friends, Daniel is not an example of what might happen to us if we follow Jesus. He's simply a model of what Jesus followers look like regardless of what happens to us. If you can see Jesus as your ultimate Daniel, you can handle any lions in your life. If you have any questions about that, If you wanna know what it means to follow Jesus, if you wanna take your next step in your personal faith journey, we have a number that we we are using for you to text so that we can respond to you. We wanna answer your questions. We wanna pray with you. We wanna help you take your next step toward Jesus. If you can see Jesus as your ultimate Daniel, there is no den that you cannot face. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful that you are a God who delivers. We don't always know what you're going to do, but we always know what you're going to do. You are going to save us if we place our faith in you. So, Father, to that end, we entrust our lives to you. We live for you. We honor you. And we do whatever you called us to do because you alone, God, are the God who saves. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.